Sound off for Chesterfield. Chesterfield, the only cigarette in America to give you premium quality in both regular and king size, brings you Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to forgery detail. A check forger has been hitting the merchants in your city. From the M.O. she uses, you know she's an expert. You've got a description. Your job, get her. There's only one premium quality cigarette in America, available in both regular and king size, and that is Chesterfield. Premium quality in a cigarette means the world's best tobaccos, the best ingredients, the best cigarette paper. Only Chesterfield gives you this premium quality in both popular sizes. King size Chesterfield contains tobaccos of better quality and higher price than any other king size cigarette. That's certainly important to every king-size smoker. Of course, it's the same fine tobacco as in regular Chesterfield. There is absolutely no difference, except that king-size Chesterfield is larger, contains so much more of these premium-quality tobaccos that you get more than a fifth longer smoke from king-size Chesterfield. Yes, the modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality. Both regular and king size. And either way you like them, Chesterfields are much milder. Chesterfield is best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, February 6th. It was cool in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of forgery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Welsh. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the forgery office, and it was 10.22 a.m. when I got to the mug room. I'm sure about it, officer. If I ever see that woman again, I'll know her. Don't you have any doubt about it? I'll know her. Yes, ma'am. Now, if you'll just look through this book, please. Have you seen anyone who might be the woman, Miss Parkinson? No, not yet, Sergeant. But if she's got her picture in here, I'll find it for you. Never forget that face. So sweet and kindly. Sort of reminded me of my mother, rest her soul. I think that's why I cashed the check for her. I never would have done it if there hadn't been something like that. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if you'd mind running over it again for us. Might have been something you forgot, maybe. No, no, no. I wouldn't forget anything about her, but I can tell you about it if you'd like. All right, fine, Miss Parkinson. If you just start at the beginning again. Fine. Would you mind calling me Ethel? I don't much care for formality. Feel better when people call me by my given name. Yes, ma'am. If you go right ahead, please. Well, this morning's when I found out about it. Like to keeled right over when the check came back from the bank. Opened up the other mail, mostly from people who want to sell me things for the store, and there it was. Letter from the bank with the check inside. Stapled to one of those forms. You know, the kind they just checked with a pencil? Uh-huh. Well, like I said, there it was. Place that was checked said the account was unknown. Well, you can just bet I got on the phone and called the bank people. Yes, ma'am, I understand. I told them they'd made some sort of mistake, that they'd better set it right. I was so sure that she wouldn't do a thing like this. Well, you know how banks are. They said they'd check it for me, and I waited on the phone while they did. And they said it wasn't any mistake. Well, you can just bet that I was hopping mad. Yeah, well, what kind of identification did the woman use to get you to cash the check? Well, she had several letters from her son. At least that's who she said they were from. I just bet she hasn't even got a son. Well, sir, I'll bet she hasn't. Well, do you usually cash checks with that little identification? No, I don't as a rule. I usually ask for a driver's license and a social security card. Figure that if a person's got one of those, that means that he's working. Figures that the check is good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not always true, you know, ma'am. I mean, don't I know it now? You just bet I do. Last time I'll cash a check for anyone that I haven't known for ten years. Mm -hmm. Had you seen this woman around your store before this time? I've been trying to think about that. The shop isn't very big, but we do a pretty good business. Sometimes there are several people waiting. Get in a hurry, you know, and you aren't sure who you talk to. Yes, ma'am. Seems to me I've seen her in the store before, but when I stop and really think about it, I'm not too sure. You know how that is? Yes, ma'am, I do. But when you boil it right down, I don't think I have seen her before. She just had one of those faces that you figure sure you know. Looked like such a lovely person. I see. About how old do you figure she was, ma'am? Well, like I said, I guess about 62, maybe a little older. Uh -huh. Might have been 65. Not much over that, though. Such pretty hair. Pure white had it fixed in a real soft wave over her forehead. Old-fashioned kind of. Wore it in a bun, you know. Ma'am? Bun. Had the hair all rolled up and then pinned up back. Here. 
back of her neck. It was white, you say? Her hair was white. Yes. Looks so nice to see a woman act and look her age. So many of them try to look younger, you know. Yes, ma'am. How about her clothes? Oh, she was well-dressed, had a sort of uh, teal blue suit on, a black coat. Looked kind of like it might have been cashmere. Looked real nice. Little string gloves and all. You say she was a small woman, is that right? Yes, she was little. Stood Mm -hmm. real straight, you know, shoulders back. But she was a little one, not more than five foot one or maybe two. Mm -hmm. Would she be slight or heavy? Beg pardon? Well, how much would you say she weighed? Maybe a hundred pounds. Say she wasn't much heavier than that. No, sir, a hundred pounds. Was there anything unusual about her? Anything that might make her stand out? No, no, I don't think so. Except maybe it was the perfume. Ma'am? Perfume. You know, how you kind of expect a little old lady to wear something kind of mild like violet, maybe. Some light. Yes, ma'am. Well, she had a real heavy perfume on. It smelled kind of like a French scent. Real heavy, like I said. It was one thing I couldn't figure out. What's that, ma'am? Well, she did have nice clothes and all, but all in all, she didn't look like she had a lot of money. Just moderate, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that perfume must have been expensive. Must have cost a lot. Well, I guess she's making enough to afford it, ma'am. 10.34 a.m. Mrs. Parkinson continued to look through the mug books. She was unable to identify the woman who had passed the bad check. The merchants of the city had been victimized for the past three weeks by a forger. All of them described her as a kindly old lady using letters from her son in the East as identification. Frank and I had run the description we'd gotten through R&I with no result. The stats office had made several runs on the M.O., and all leads furnished by them had been checked out, but they let us nowhere. We'd obtained copies of the forged checks, and they'd been processed by Don Meyer in handwriting, but he'd been unable to offer us any new information. The names on each of the checks were different. We checked each of them out, but the leads went nowhere. All of the stores in the central area had been alerted. Descriptions had been distributed to the neighborhood merchants, but the check passing continued. We checked with our informants, but they failed to come up with any information. Two weeks passed. The woman hit 12 more times. Her take was estimated to be over $2,500. The checks she passed were always for the same amount, $50. When it seemed necessary, she would purchase merchandise in order to cash the check. The articles she chose were in a price range so that the store owner would often cash the check rather than lose the sale. Thursday, February 21st, 8.34 a.m. Frank and I got back to the office. I'll get it. Forgery, Friday. Yeah. All right, where? How soon? All right. No, we'll see you there. What is it? Harry Allenson. Informer? Yeah, says he wants to see us right away. Yeah. Says he knows the woman we're looking for. The working detective knows that he's usually only as good as his informants. Quite often, when all other means of bringing a case to a successful conclusion have failed, the only thing that'll break it is information supplied by an informant. A detective will protect his informant. For as long as the informant can operate, the detective is assured of a steady flow of information. 9.45 a.m., Frank and I drove over to the coffee shop at the corner of Crawford and Spring Streets. Harry Allenson wasn't there when we arrived. We sat down and ordered a cup of coffee. Oh, that's good and hot. Yeah, it is. Hey, pass the sugar, will you, Joe? Yeah. There you go. Thanks. I wonder where Allenson is. What time did he say he'd be here? 9.45. Well, it's only a couple of minutes after that now. He'll be here. I wonder how right his story is. What did he tell you on the phone? Nothing, just that he knew what we were looking for. That if we'd meet him here, he'd fill us in. There he is. Oh, yeah. All righty. Harry? Sit down. Yeah. Sorry, I'm late. Got hung up in traffic. Oh, you got a car now, Harry? No, I missed my streetcar. Had to wait for another. Uh Say, uh, you guys had breakfast yet? Yeah, we did a little earlier. You mind if I have something to eat? Oh, go ahead. Where's the waitress? Well, she was here a minute ago. I don't see her now. I'll go get her myself. Sure you guys don't want anything to eat? No, no, thanks. Just the same, Harry. Okay, be right back. Well, here we go again, Joe. Yep. Last time we met him, his meal cost two fifty. How much dough you got on you? Well, I got a couple of bucks. How are you fixed? Oh, well, not much better. Let's hope he doesn't order too much, though. How about some more coffee for you guys? No, no thanks, Harry. Uh, Chow will be up in a minute. All right, how about this information, Harry, about the paper hanger? Oh, yeah. Funny the way I got it. That right? Yeah, I was up in Jack's bar last night. You know, just having a beer, shooting the breeze. All of a sudden, this old girl comes into the place. Kind of set everybody back on their heels. Looks so nice. Yeah, go ahead. Well, she slides up on one of the stools and orders a drink. Even Jack was taken in. Changed his apron and all. Anyway, she climbs up on the stool and orders some sherry. Made a big thing of it. What do you mean? Well, Jack started to pour some of it for her, and she stopped him. Said that she wanted California sherry. Said she didn't want any of that imported stuff. Said her family was one of the first ones in the state and that she believed in using homegrown products. She was kind of cute about it. Real little woman perched up on that stool. Looked a little like a cartoon. 
You know, the ones with the little old lady guzzling martini. Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, say, hold on a minute, will you? My food's ready. Be right back. Okay, honey. How do you like that guy? It takes him five hours to get a point over. Well, there's nothing you can do about it, Frank. He's got to tell it his way. Well, I suppose so. <sighs> nothing like a big breakfast. I always say if you stoke up in the morning, you got it made for the day. Yeah, that's right, Harry. Farm breakfast, they call this. I tell you, that's eating. Oh, look at that sausage. Fried real good. I like it when it's like a rock. Can't stand pork that hasn't been cooked enough. Yeah. You want to go on with the story? Oh, yeah. Uh, don't mind if I eat, do you? Got a big day today. A lot of things to do. No, you go right ahead, Harry. All right. Well, like I said, this old broad ordered the sherry. Uh-huh. Well, time went on. She must have had three or four of them. Yeah. A couple other guys came in, and I moved over to make room for them. Ended up sitting right next to the woman. Huh. Say, pass the ketchup, will you? Oh, yeah. There you go. Eggs aren't much good without a lot of ketchup. Gives them real flavor. Yeah. Harry, could you get the point maybe a little sooner? Oh. Well, first off, I noticed this perfume this broad's wearing. Well, now I tell you, it's been a long time since I smelled anything like that. Real heavy. Like the stuff they sell in France. Yeah. Didn't fit the woman. Now, sir, didn't seem to go with the rest of her. I tried to strike up a conversation, you know, talked about the weather, stuff like that, but she wouldn't have none of it. She didn't actually tell me, but... I could tell the way she answered me, you know, kind of cool. What makes you think she might be the one we're looking for? The way she looked, the way she worked. What do you mean, the way she worked? Well, I'm getting to it. Anyway, after she's had the sherry, she reached into her purse to pay for him. Almost around in it for a while. Well, I couldn't help seeing what was in it, you know, what was sitting right next to her and all. Yeah, sure. Well, she don't come up with any money. And she starts going through her pockets. Still can't find any money. Finally, she asked Jack. Who's that, the bartender? Yeah, yeah, Jack. He owns the place. She asked him if he'll cash a check. Yeah. Well, now I asked you. Either one of you guys know Jack? No, I don't think we do, Harry. No, I don't. Well, Jack wouldn't cash a check for the treasurer of the country. Not even if he had the president to vouch for him. Been stung too many times. Yeah. Well, this old gal gets to him, see? I can see him start to go. He kind of hems and haws around all the time. He's trying to figure out a nice way to say no to her. Mm-hmm. Finally, he just ups and says it. Well... Right after he kind of waits and expects her to tell him off for being so mean to somebody like her, but she doesn't. Just kind of hunches her shoulders and then starts digging in her purse again. Takes everything out, puts it on the bar. Yeah. Now, well, it happens that her driver's license is lying right there on the bar in front of me. Couldn't help but read it, you know. Yeah, we know. Well, I saw her name, and I asked her if she'd let me buy the wine for it. Mm-hmm. What'd she say to that? Well, when I called her by name, she acted kind of startled like she didn't expect it, and then she kind of smiled and said she was financially embarrassed at the moment. Something about coming away from the house without any money, but she said she thought it'd be very sweet of me if I'd take care of the tab. So I paid Jack the money, and, and I asked her if she'd like another one. And she said she didn't think so, and then she got all her stuff together and put it back into her purse and thanks me. Then she got up and left. Yeah, well, what was the name on the driver's license? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Got it written down here someplace. After she left, Jack and me got to talking about her, and then it hit me that she might be the one you're looking for. So I jotted down the name. You ever see this woman before, Harry? No, never laid eyes on her before she walked into Jack's last night. Now, here it is. Mm -hmm, thanks. Yeah, that's the name at the top of the paper. Right under, that's your address. The name on the piece of paper was Lillian Halstead. It was a new name in the case. It gave an address out near Bel Air. Frank and I called the name into R&I, but they had no record on anyone answering that description. We paid the check and thanked Harry Allenson for the information, and then we drove out to the address. It was a large house just off Sunset Boulevard. Mrs. Halstead wasn't in, but the maid told us that we'd find her husband at the Halstead School of Dramatic Arts. She gave us the address, and Frank and I drove out to the school. It was located in a large modern building out on Wilshire Boulevard. When we got there, Mr. Halstead was working with the advanced class in the drama section. We took a seat at the rear of the auditorium and waited for him to finish. Uh, you gentlemen wish to see me? Uh, yes, sir. You're Mr. Halstead, are you? That's correct. Police officer, sir. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Well, how do you do? I do. Uh, uh, what is it that you'd like to see me about? Well, can you tell us where your wife is, sir? Lillian? Yes. Well, she's out of town. Why? What do you want with her? Well, what if you could describe her for us? Well, certainly. I, I don't understand what this is all about, though. Well, it's just a routine investigation. Routine? What's that mean? Well, just that we're conducting an investigation and a woman with the same name as your wife came up. We're just checking it out. Now, if you could give us a description of your wife, please. Yes, well, let me see. Um, Lillian's 36. Yes, I, I would say she's um, uh, five feet, six and one half inches. Uh, weighs perhaps uh, 130 pounds. Mm -hmm. What color is her hair, Mr. Halstead? Well, before she left, it was sort of an auburn. 
Lillian said something about dying at red. Might have done it since she's been gone. Where's your wife now? She's back in Washington. They're holding a drama festival, and she's back there looking it over. Do you have a picture of your wife here, Mr. Halstead? Yes, sir. I have one on my desk in the office. What if we take a look at it? Why, certainly. Uh, you can go out this way. Fine, thank you. Uh, here, down this way, please. Thank you. Uh, you tell me what this investigation is that you're working on. Well, no, sir, not right now. We can't. Oh, you can. Uh, cloak and dagger stuff, eh? No, sir, it's not exactly that. Oh, here, I'll get the door for you. Thank you. Yes, sir, right this way. Excuse me a moment. All right, here. Here's the picture. Lovely woman. Been a great help here at the school. Yes, sir. How long ago was this picture taken? Mm, several months ago, I believe. Well, Mr. Halstead, how long has your wife been out of town? Mm, perhaps a week. Ten days, perhaps. Uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. Does your wife drive a car, Mr. Halstead? Yes, sir, she does. Oh, I understand. The license. Sir? Lillian's driver's license. That's what you hear about, isn't it? Well, I don't understand, sir. <laughs> oh, you don't have to be cagey with me. Lillian lost her driver's license some time ago, asked me to get her a new one. I didn't quite get a chance to do it. You found it. Uh, that's it, isn't it? No, sir, that's not. We think your wife's license has been used as identification by some check forger. Do you happen to know where your wife might have lost the license? Why, no, we, we don't know exactly. It must have been about uh, three months ago. Uh, she says that she dropped it here at the school, but I've looked all over for it, haven't been able to find it. I, I think she just left it someplace. She's terribly careless about things like that. Yes, sir. Uh, is this about the old woman that's been forging the checks? Well, why do you ask that, sir? Well, that's another thing that I've been meaning to call you about. I was reading the paper one night, and all of a sudden it hit me. Sir? Well, I could be wrong, but I think I know the girl who's doing this. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. The modern way to sell cigarettes is the Chesterfield way. Premium quality in both regular and king size. And we're the only one that does it. We tell you what Chesterfields are made of to give you that premium quality in both popular sizes. Our scientists select the best materials. They select for Chesterfield the world's best tobaccos. Blend them just right. And they keep Chesterfields tasty and fresh with the best of moistening agents. Now here's something else that's completely modern about Chesterfield. People smoke Chesterfield, and we tell you what happens. Scientifically, but simply. A medical specialist is making regular bi-monthly examinations of a group of people from various walks of life. Forty-five percent of this group have smoked Chesterfield for an average of over ten years. After eight months, the medical specialist reports that he observed no adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfield. Well, I'd say that means real mildness. And finally, we ask you to try Chesterfield and prove what we say. Chesterfield is best for you. They're much milder to give you all the pleasure that the modern cigarette can give. Two thirty-seven p.m. We ran the name Bert Halstead through R and I, but we got no make on anyone answering his description. Halstead told us that he thought we might be looking for a girl he identified as Peggy Small. He told us that the small girl had enrolled in the dramatic school over a year before. We asked him if he had a picture of her that we could have, and he told us that he thought there was one in the files. He took us down the hall to the registration office and checked his files. He located a picture of the girl and handed it to Frank. Well, just why do you think this might be the girl we're looking for, Mr. Halstead? Well, it's the oddest thing, officer. Peggy. Oh, that's Miss Small. Yes, sir. Well, Peggy came to us about a year ago, as I said. She came out here to the coast from some little town in Idaho, I think it was. I'd have to check her entrance application to be sure, but I think it was Idaho. Yes, sir. Well, instantly I knew that this girl had talent, real talent, deep down, talent. Right off the bat, she had the feel. Would have been a fine character actress. Well, why do you say would have? She didn't want to work wasn't interested in anything but learning how to be an old woman. Sir? All she was interested in was learning to act like a little old woman. Oh. Now, we have a theory here at Halstead. Don't act, live. She did just that. Learned the makeup problems, dress, walk, everything. 
She even used to practice writing like a woman of 60 or so. I used to see her practicing by the hour. Did she ever give you any reason for all this? No. I asked her once, but she said that this was the way she wanted it. Now, I thought that she was trying to tell me to keep my nose out of her affairs in a nice way, so I didn't ask her again. Mm -hmm. Now, we have presentations here, you know. Each term, the class presents a play that's been written and produced by the students themselves. Yes, sir. Uh, Peggy would always do the oldest female part in them. Never was interested in anything else. She had several good offers, but for some reason, she did not take them. What do you mean by that, sir? Well, one night, a talent scout from one of the majors came out to see our play. Well, he was quite... Majors, oh, the studio. Uh, he was quite impressed with Peggy, offered her a term contract, good money. She'd have done well, but she just was not interested. I just can't understand it. Well, do you know where she is now? No, officer, I haven't seen Peggy since she left here. That was about um, four months ago. I wonder if you could tell us where she lived when she was enrolled here. Certainly. I have the address on her enrollment card. Well, that's fine. We'd like to have the names and addresses of any of her close friends, too, if we could. Oh, certainly glad to help. You think it could be her, Peggy, the woman you're looking for? Well, it could be, yes, sir. Odd. Now, I got to thinking about it when I read about it in the papers. Right away, it made me think of Peggy. How she used to talk about acting. Well, how's that, sir? Well, she used to always say there was only one reason for doing anything, and that was to come out on it. That was the trouble with most people. <laughs> they just didn't know where they wanted to end up. But she knew where she was going. Well, maybe she was right. I beg your pardon? She's the one we're looking for, we know, too. <laughs> 3 12 p.m. We got Peggy Small's address from Mr. Halstead, and then we went back to the office. We ran the name through R&I, but there was no record on the girl. 4.02 p.m. Frank and I drove out to the last known address of the small girl. It was a boarding house on 92nd Street. Peggy Small wasn't in, but the landlady told us that she usually didn't get back from work until 7 or 7.30. We asked if she knew where the girl worked, but she told us that she didn't. We arranged for a stakeout on the house, and at 4.37 p.m., we checked back into the office. You want to check the book? Right. Anything? I don't think so. There's a call from Faye. She wants to know if I'll be home for dinner. I better give her a call, Joe. Mm-hmm. Faye's getting a little hacked at me. Was oh, that so? Yeah. Last three nights she's waited dinner for me and I didn't make it. Mm-hmm. Hello, honey. Yeah. Well, I don't know yet. Uh, yeah. I don't I think so. I know, I know. Well, maybe another hour or so I'll know. Yeah. Okay, honey. Bye. If I don't make it tonight, she's going to scout me. I get it. Forgery Friday. Yes, ma'am. What's that address again? All right. Yes, ma'am. We'll be right there. Well, your dinner's going to have to wait again. Why? Dry goods store out on Main. Forgery's there now. In the process of the investigation, the police department had alerted the merchants throughout the city to the method of operation of the woman forger. Thousands of printed circulars had been distributed bearing her description. An artist's conception of the woman had been published in the daily papers, and the drawing had also been broadcast over the local television stations. The clerk in the store we'd gotten the call from had noticed the similarity between a woman waiting to cash a check and the description. From the information we'd gotten on the hot shot, the woman was waiting for an authorization for the check. When Frank and I got to the store, we met a small elderly woman. She produced identification in the form of a driver's license bearing the name Lillian Halstead. Frank and I asked her to go with us to the city hall for questioning. A policewoman was called and the interrogation started. One look at her and you could see that she was covered with a heavy makeup. I want you gentlemen to know that I resent the implication you're making. The idea of trying to make me out a vicious criminal. Ma'am, we're not trying to embarrass you. We just want to get to the truth here. I'm giving you that. I'm telling you what you want to know. All right, now let's get it over with. What's your name? Lillian Halstead. Is this your driver's license? Yes, it is. Then the thumbprint on it should be yours too, is that right? I'd imagine so, yes. Well, then suppose we go down the hall and take your fingerprints and compare it, huh? Now, you look here, young man. I know my rights. You're not dealing with some little schoolgirl this time. I've lived a long time, and I know just exactly what you can do and what you can't do. I know, for instance, that you can't take my fingerprints unless you want to arrest me for something. If you want to make a fool out of yourself to that extent, then you go right ahead and do it. 
And mark this well, young man. I'll sue you for every nickel you own. I'll let the papers know about this. They'd love to know how you treat old women. They'd just love to know. You ever been mistreated in any way, ma'am? No, and I don't intend to be. There's a man on the way down here, a man by the name of Halstead. Wife's name is Lillian Halstead. That driver's license we found in your purse, the one you claim is yours, that's registered to his wife. He's coming down here to tell us that you aren't his wife, that you stole that license, that you were a student in his dramatic school. Now, why don't you save us all a lot of trouble here? Why don't you admit that you're the woman we're looking for, that you're Peggy Small, you're no old woman? Come on, how about it, Miss Small? All right, I lose. Guess I should have known. Mind if I take this wig off? It's kind of warm in here. Well, we've been kind of waiting for it. Go right ahead. It was a good rack while it lasted. Crummy driver's license. I was doing all right as long as I used the letters. They should have been good enough for me. I should have known. What'd you do with the money? I've got it all. Every last nickel of it. I almost had enough, too. Enough for what? Leave this lousy town. Get out of here. Go back east, New York. A couple more pieces of paper and I'd had it made. Could have left. Almost showed him. Showed him good. Ma'am? Phony town. Months I pounded on doors, talking to agents, casting directors, talking to anybody who'd listen to me, trying to get a job, trying to get a break in pictures. None of them would talk to me. Wouldn't even see me. This phony town. Yes, ma'am. They wanted character women. Didn't want any young women, character women. That's what they wanted. Well, I got to be the best of them. They didn't want me the way I am. I didn't want to work any other way, none. Had you fooled, didn't I? Had the whole town fooled, all of them. It's a phony place. I was going back east, back to New York. They know talent back there. They recognize it. They know whether you're real there or whether you're just a phony. They know it there. Yes, ma'am. We know it here, too. The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 19th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you this scientific evidence on the effects of smoking. No adverse effects on the nose, throat, and sinuses of the group from smoking Chesterfields. And only the modern cigarette, Chesterfield, gives you premium quality in both regular and king size. Now, I know Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. Buy them, regular or king size. Either way, they're much milder to give you all the pleasure the modern cigarette can give. Peggy Janice Small was tried and convicted of forgery 10 counts. She was sentenced to the California Institution for Women at Corona, California for the term prescribed by law. Forgery is punishable by imprisonment for a period of from 1 to 14 years in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, June Whitley, Jack Crucian, Gene Tatum. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Sound off for Chesterfield. Either way you like them regular or king size, you'll find premium quality Chesterfields much milder. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet transcribed from Los Angeles. Tonight it's Adventure with Barry Craig, Confidential Investigator on NBC. NBC.